So uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. My name is Guy Berger. I'm a director at UNESCO, and I welcome you very much to this celebration of the International Day for Universal Access to Information. If you look at your screen, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a button that says interpretation and you can listen in English or French or Spanish. So uh, we're going to kick off in a minute, but we have a short video to set the tone for today. So my colleague Rassem, let it roll. Okay, I think we've got a delay there. Rasem, uh, okay, here we to go. To celebrate the International Day for Universal Access to Information, join UNESCO in affirming and reiterating the urgency to respect and maintain the right to information, especially amid the COVID-19 outbreak. In times of emergencies, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to protect the right to access information so that Communities can protect themselves and their families. Journalists debunk the falsehoods and report the facts about the disease. Scientists and policymakers provide us with directives and guidance on how to cope with the pandemic. Citizens can know the measures to prevent and mitigate the risks. That's why we need public information without delay with strong and effective institutions to keep citizens informed. Access to information is not a burden, but a right that needs to be supported by law. And any restrictions to this right should conform to the law, be proportionate and limited to protect the citizens. Join our high-level webinar on 28 September and all the online events across the world that UNESCO and partners are organizing to celebrate our right to access information. Go to our website for more information. Access to information. Saving lives, building trust, bringing hope. Thank you very much. So for those of you who have just joined us, uh, I welcome you once again and uh, alert you that there is a, an interpretation facility, English, French, Spanish on the Zoom. Please make use of it. So here we are, International Day for Universal Access to Information, and the panel we have is called Beyond the Numbers, Using Data About Access to Information to Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. So first of all, let me thank the Global Alliance for Reporting Progress on Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies, who are co-hosting the session with us. We're interested in one simple question. How is the world doing on access to information, and especially on health issues, which are, of course, the issue of our moment? Who should be interested in this question? How are we doing on access to information? Of course, governments as duty bearers, the media who help enable access to information, companies and businesses, civil society. In fact, everybody should be interested in this question. How are we doing on access to information? And that means how do we track this and how do we use the assessments to make change for the better? So we will touch on a couple of questions here in the course of this, this webinar. One is how does the monitoring and reporting on the progress to access to information give meaningful insights that are relevant to the sustainable development goals? A second question is, why does it matter that governments should be collecting data on this question? And how can that data collection be used in complementarity with other monitoring, for example, by civil society? And what's the role of other actors like internet companies who have so much data? And lastly, how does the data about access to information feed into the national and international planning reporting to really make change? So in this discussion, we're going to talk about what needs to be done, where we are, what resources are needed. Let me take a minute or two just to 
give you a bit of information on the, the context here. So the United Nations has agreed that UNESCO should monitor what we call Sustainable Development Goal 1610, which is about the adoption and the implementation of legal guarantees for access to information. So legal guarantees are mainly the right to information law, but can be other uh, legal guarantees, court cases, constitutional provisions, and so on. But it's where the countries have adopted these guarantees and most importantly, how they're implementing them. So UNESCO has been doing this work of, mon of monitoring SDG 1610 with kind support of Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands. And the results of this monitoring, we produce in an annual report to the UN Secretary General. And it's part of the discussion that takes place each year in New York at the high level political forum about how the world is moving or not moving on SDGs. Now, two years ago, this monitoring work done by UNESCO was discussed at a committee here at UNESCO, which we call IPDC, which is an acronym, International Program for the Development of Communication, IPDC. This IPDC committee two years ago mandated us, the, UN sec uh, the UNESCO Secretariat, to develop a research instrument to better monitor what's happening and they asked us to report on this. So in fact, we have a report coming up, which the IPDC states will debate in November. IPDC itself, this International Programme for the Development of Communication, it has supported many projects over the years that have uh, helped countries introduce right to information laws, helped journalists learn how to use these laws, and more recently, how we can monitor these laws. For example, recently this IPDC supported the Voch del Sur project in eight Latin American countries that produces a shadow report on access to information in the region. Now, the good news is that to date, as many as 127 UN member states have adopted these guarantees for public access to information, constitutional, statutory, or policy guarantees. Now, as per our mandate at UNESCO, we are looking at the implementation of these guarantees and we're using a survey instrument that we designed according to an indicator that goes hand in hand with this SDG 1610, which is public access to information, fundamental freedoms, what the world should be including in its development agenda. So we have a survey instrument and we administered it earlier this year. 62 countries responded this year. We had hoped for more, but of course, COVID is a bit disruptive, uh, more than a bit disruptive. So of these 62 countries that responded to our survey of access to information, how it's going, almost 70% responded that they do have specialized oversight institutions that have the power to make a binding decision about the release of information. This is good to hear because it signals that there are teeth behind the making of access to information into a reality. But the bad news, the other, the other side of it is that 30% of respondents don't have this power. And that means that their institutions charged with making information available may be only playing a symbolic role. So of course there's space to improve this and there's space for more states of course to have these legal constitutional and other guarantees. The second finding of this UNESCO research was that only 65% of the respondents could give us statistics about how many requests for information they received from the public during 2019. A little bit better is the response about how long they took to respond to the requests made to them. Most said they are responding within 30 days. However, nearly one in five respondents said they have no data on how long it was taking to respond to requests for information. So these findings tell us that we should not be surprised to see that in a number of countries, there have been particular challenges regarding the provision of information about the pandemic, the reliability, accuracy, and the completeness of this. You can imagine from these general statistics I've given you, about if we applied it specifically to COVID. If there are no records on COVID testing and infection rates, 
And if the results were taking up to 30 days or more, we would be in a very bad situation. Now, fortunately, that's not the case, generally speaking, with COVID. The world is showing that we can keep records and we can improve test result turnaround time. So hopefully these lessons can permeate information access more widely, at least in the realm of health information, for example, at vaccination rates, particularly once we get a, a vaccination, but also in other areas of society where there's such a need for information like about the economy, education, rescue packages, procurement under COVID and so on. Now, our third finding, significant finding, the last one I'll mention is that 90% of the countries who responded to our survey have got a mandate to proactively disclose information. This is very, very important because it's not just responding to requests, it's making it available. Now, recently we published uh, what we call the right to information in times of crisis. And I'm going to post the link in the chat. This is a UNESCO publication, which I, I highly commend. It's short, it's easy to read. This point makes the, the very important observation that the more proactively a government is disclosing information, the less it has to invest in dealing with individual requests. So this is a useful tip. Put your money into proactive disclosure, including automatic disclosure, and then you don't have to pay so much for people to be responding all the time. So it's, a, it's, it's the logic of being transparent. Now, these findings I've shared with you in November, the IPDC states will discuss them. The council of the IPDC, this 39 member council, 39 member state council may decide to encourage states to one, respond in greater numbers to next year's UNESCO survey, above the 62 who responded this year, and two, to build more effective data sets for record keeping so that the state of access to information can be monitored and assessed for national purposes, as well as for contributing to the monitoring of the global trends, because we'd like to have these global benchmarks to see if anybody is being left behind and who's going ahead and what the good practices might be. Right, now I'm coming towards handing over to our panel. I just wanted to say that as COVID-19 has accelerated, we live in a time today where a huge amount of information and data is being held by the internet and telecoms companies. Now, as with governments, there's room for these companies to improve their transparency so that at least the public and health authorities have access to the massive private data holdings with due respect to privacy, of course. But this is data that also is about disinformation and misinformation, because today we're concerned with the so you, International Day for Universal Access to Information, not access to disinformation. But we need to have data about what false and misleading content is growing online, how it's being distributed, how it's being recommended, how the algorithms are playing this, this game, because this a key moment between the supply of information and content and the consumption, this, the transmission, what's going on in that black box is critically important if we especially want to find out about what is the misinformation uh, about public health and how we can counter it with information and access to information. The second last point I make here is that today, uh, the ATI oversight bodies, and we have at least one commissioner with us here, they've had to adapt to working in COVID conditions. Now, a big challenge is not just adaptation, but for them to play a proactive, outgoing role in encouraging and overseeing transparency in the government health departments, departments of economics and finance, in the schools, and all sectors that are hit by the crisis, because information is the foundation for knowledge-based policy across the board. In other words, these information commissions or the equivalent bodies are vital to give guidance to the state institutions about how to deal with access to information in COVID times. So to discuss all these issues, we have a wonderful panel here. Now, we, were hope, we, we hope we could be joined by Frederic Kosher, but uh, I, Frederica, could you shout if you're here? I think uh, she had- a Yes, trip. I'm here. Unfortunately, my camera isn't working. Ah. But, but the microphone is working, I hope. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So Friederike Karsha, she's the head of the section for media, culture, creativity and sport in the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, uh, Germany, one of the partners that's made it possible for UNESCO to do this research and to capacitate and train 
lots of the officials to produce this data that uh, is so important. Frederica, you're going to make some welcoming remarks. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Guy Berger. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm actually calling from Berlin. I'm delighted to be part of this webinar. Thank you, UNESCO, and thank you, Guy Berger and your team for organizing it and for giving me the opportunity to provide a few introductory remarks. And I'm really sorry for everyone, to everyone that my camera unfortunately is not working, um, but I hope you can, you can hear me. So in recent years, there have been several opportunities to reflect on the situation of freedom of the press or freedom of expression, especially on World Press Freedom Day, as you know, on May 3rd. We all know the annual ranking of Reporters Without Borders, for example, but often a very fundamental question is overlooked. Only if the media have access to um, public information can they fulfill their information mission and hold governments to account. This was particularly true and evident uh, during the COVID-19 crisis of the last six months when the level of disinformation reached the point of an infodemic, as the World Health Organization termed it. Germany is therefore delighted and very supportive to see this issue represented in this first official observance of International Day for Universal Access to Information by the whole UN. Highlighting access to information on its own is a testament to its significance for democracy and sustainable development. ATI, access to information, cannot be seen separately from media development. Basically two sides of the same coin. Independent media inform the public and speak truth to power only with access to information. So without independent media, the public cannot fully exercise their rights, including civil rights, but also the right to information, of course. So it definitely is an issue of democracy and good governance. Significant progress has been made in the last years, especially the adoption of ATI laws. As guys already mentioned, 127 countries have adopted ATI laws with a strong positive trend in the last decade. Since 2010, there has been an increase of almost 50% with 42 countries. And interestingly, according to RTI ratings, or right to information rating.org, a website which rates the legal strength of national uh, access to information laws, um, has shown that more recent laws are stronger and the Global South has in general more robust regulations to legally guarantee access to public information than the Global North, which I thought was a very interesting fact. Nevertheless, as we all know, it is quite away from passing legislation to the effective implementation of these laws. Why? In our opinion, three issues lack of resources and capacities, lack of political will, and lack of data. The good news is all three issues can be tackled. Germany has built quite a portfolio on media development. We're engaged in about 30 countries worldwide with an annual budget of around 30 million euros. Via our partners like Deutsche Welle Academy, who you probably know, and I think they're also listening in today, and media NGOs, like, for example, Reporters Without Borders, we actively support the strengthening of ATI implementation. Our approach includes, A, the supply side, meaning the governments, and B, the demand side, meaning media, civil society, and the wider public. Just to give you two examples, in Pakistan, we have a pilot project uh, to where we train media and data journalism and we also trained governmental representatives in dealing with information requests. Subsequently, recommendations on how to improve implementation were jointly developed. So we believe in this holistic approach. Another example, in Ghana, local policymakers and civil servants are being trained on how to increase the transparency of their work, the results of which are then set into local standards to further improve the exchange of information on government actions. In addition, and this is, of course, in this context, the, the most important uh, um, project to mention, we have established a partnership with UNESCO as UN lead agency on SDG 1610 that Guy has already mentioned. So we thank and support Guy Berger and his team to help improve access to information monitoring in Africa. And in this project, too, we are taking both sides into account, governments as well as the media and civil society. 
This project is actually engaged in six countries in Africa, and it's part of Germany's contribution to the G20 Africa partnership. During the first year, which was basically in 2019, the project implementation focused on engaging local stakeholders in the preparation of voluntary national reviews at the high level political forum held in New York in July 2019. This was done successfully through organizing multi stakeholder meetings and capacity development. And I have to share a little secret with you. I've always been a little skeptical when we talk about reporting because it sounds very dry, very theoretical. We talk about numbers, but it becomes clear very soon that they are really the missing link between, uh, between passing laws and implementing them. It's the information we need. So the second year of this project has been challenging due to COVID-19. As you know, the current pandemic has been detrimental really to access to information. Lockdown measures to curb the spreading of COVID equally affected access to information guarantees and services which were either altered or outright suspended. In most countries, the response time to access to information requests has been extended, making it harder for media, civil society and the wider public to scrutinize governmental decisions in time. But the need for reliable information has never been higher because in our opinion, information saves lives and really no crisis can be resolved without uh, media and without um, freedom of the media and access to information. So access to information and transparency need to be at the core of each effort trying to tackle this crisis. My minister, the Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, Dr. Gerd Müller, has launched an immediate corona response program and was keen to include media development cooperation in this package. Uh, and our focus is to, to support local media who know best about the situation in the next school, the next hospital, or uh, the closest refugee camp, much more so than perhaps uh, information campaigns of UN organizations, as relevant as they are. But in these times of crisis, we believe that people need to be able to trust and use the media they know, their local media. We are also um, planning a new initiative on transparency and freedom of the media to counter the impact of COVID-19, including, for example, supporting individual, individual journalists and media outlets with health reporting, um, tasks like, and challenges like fact-checking and credibility of media, access to reliable information of vulnerable groups and re remote groups, and crisis communications also of small communities, especially at the local level. So we consider the collection of data and evidence on access to information implementation as one of the key entry points to improve access to information, as theoretical and as dry as it may sound. All further efforts build on this data collection. The pandemic, and I'm, I'm coming to an end now, the pandemic has shown the effects of a lack of reliable information and we aim to close this gap. Strengthening freedom of expression equals strengthening media development and access to information implementation. As I mentioned, the approach we believe to access to information needs to be as holistic as possible. As possible. Monitoring and reporting on access to information is definitely an area where a lot of work remains to be done. So let's get to work and happy first birthday International Day for Universal Access to Information. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, very rich remarks uh, and that your point is well taken about the danger of treating this data about access to information as if it was a dry subject that has um, only abstract connection to, to reality. So I'm pleased to say we've got a video now which I hope will be anything but dry and then we'll go into uh, the comments from uh, the Commissioner Right to Information Commission of Sri Lanka, Kishali Pinto Jayawardena, uh, because this very short video is about RTI in Sri Lanka. And I think this will help us understand the, the color and the issues and the drama and the people and the potential behind monitoring this question of access to information. So Rasem, if you could uh, roll us the video about uh, RTI, please. 
Party ein, Sri Lanka. On the road to sustainable development, Sri Lanka provides an interesting case study. Free education and health policies have resulted in high youth literacy rates of 98.7% and high life expectancy of 75 years. Measured by its Human Development Index, Sri Lanka has historically been a high achiever in the region. However, decades of ethnic and civil conflict have undermined the full realization of these impressive social development goals. In a country that has been gripped by conflict in the past, with thousands of disappearances of people from all communities at one time, the rule of law has been more of a constitutional principle rather than being practically realized. Corruption has sapped the governance process. Institutional transparency and justice for victims have become increasingly unattainable. Transforming our world, the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted by all UN countries and they serve as the international roadmap for development. The Right to Information Law, unanimously enacted by Sri Lanka's parliament in 2016, is a prerequisite to achieving sustainable development goals. One of SDG's most significant commitments is Goal 16. On the long road to recovery, use of RTI in remote villages and urban centers has empowered citizens to challenge the state. Mass movements have been created around issues of corruption. The RTI law, as we refer to it, came out of a 15-year-old struggle in Sri Lanka. Uh, and it was enacted in 2016, August. Sri Lanka did not have a people-based RTI movement. It was a more elite kind of movement in the city. But the RTI law has been used very much by ordinary people in Sri Lanka in very remote places, in very remote parts. <laughs> We have had instances where information release has led not only to the mere release of the information, but people challenging governance and government itself. A good instance recently in the North Central Province, where uh, there had been major corruption in the building of tanks and, and uh, roads in that particular area. And because of RTI, because villagers filed RTI applications, they discovered the fraud and the money was returned to government. The pub public of officials were actually dismissed from their office and they built the tanks and the roads all over again. Now, this was a good example of the people coming together from a very remote area of Sri Lanka and actually getting out the streets and demonstrating and asking for things to be changed because of right to information.
பதில் ஒன்று வந்தி வந்து கேட்டாங்க உங்களுக்கு இந்த வழி யார் காடி தந்த நாங்கள் சரி நான் எத்தனை காடி தந்திருக்கேன் எத்தனை எம்பிட்ட போயிருக்கேன் ஒருத்தர் மணிக்கு நடவடிக்கை எடுக்கணும் நான் அதில் நான் இந்த வழியில் இறங்கினேன் சின்னத்தில் நாலு சோறும் அவள் வாங்கின வண்டி அனுப்பி கொண்டே இருப்பாங்க இப்போ எங்களுக்கு கொஞ்சம் நல்ல எல்லாம் and rti became like this thing where you went for, uh, to it for everything for everything that you had you couldn't find normal service delivery government permits car permits uh, you know land deeds whatever it was basically uh, you know sort of seen as a panacea for many many years in sri lanka and people kept going to rti act and filing these requests um, but we've handed down uh, hundreds of orders up to now and uh, public authorities in sri lanka have actually complied with the commission's directives so there's been no public authority that have said we are not going to obey you we are going to resist you we are going to the court of appeal where we are not going to give you the information they have not really said that they have all complied immediately we are sending the reply in anything in the initial stage uh, we had some issues uh, nearly one year uh, so they know okay sir vishayam public interest illama personal interest kaga vendiya In Sri Lanka's deep south, villagers from Mathura explain how they use the RTI Act to stop sewage and wastewater flowing through their village. RTI has been a common point of activism for communities divided on racial and communal lines. It has brought the disempowered in Sri Lanka onto a common platform of fighting corruption and changing government policy. In a short period of time, the RTI regime has forced the guardians of public resources to be accountable. RTI, a law conceived in seclusion, has now entered the vocabulary of the grassroots. Okay, well, uh, we have with us uh, Kishali, uh, who you saw in the movie, and uh, it's fantastic to have her here live, and uh, I think uh, we can hear more from her about uh, RTI in Sri Lanka. I have uh, three questions, and uh, I'd ask her to respond, uh, perhaps two minutes to each question, and then we'll move the program on. But I wanted to say, uh, Kishali, that in the... IPDC, this forthcoming report, uh, which I have here for this IPDC Council, it is mentioned that uh, in Sri Lanka, ATI has had a specific impact on gender empowerment, which of course is uh, about one of the SDGs. So could you tell us, how does your approach as RTI Commissioner in Sri Lanka, how does the gender issue uh, play out in terms of people using the right to information promoting the right information, getting information that is relevant to, to gender issues. Hello, Guy, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here to talk on this uh, particular day of great importance um, to Sri Lanka and to the world. Um, your question is actually quite an interesting question, Guy, because um, you see the impact of women and the way they've used RTI in Sri Lanka has been a, a very direct of very direct impact to the commission uh, see we have uh, realized after four years of the right to information regime working in the country that women are in fact the primary drivers of the rti movement um, they are the people who are using rti in the rural parts of sri lanka which is a wonderful thing um, and basically what we see is that the enthusiasm and the vigor with which women are using the right to information is unbelievable. I just returned from a visit to the southern Okay, Shali, you're breaking up a bit there. Parts of the country because we and that mark uh, world RTI day yesterday. And uh, it was with and the rural health centers in their villages. Now, uh, during the COVID time, 
to us and better health facilities from with covid in a sense we had a shutdown for about 2 3 months but yet the fact that this had awakened or awoken the women in particular to look out for the health of their families and to demand that the government the state provide them with those facilities was of great importance and when those uh, area district officers they had in fact looked at their budgets and found that there had been many many irregularities in the provision of uh, facilities to the rural hospitals and in fact they gave those particular facilities to those hospitals in the southern parts of the country now here this is the most important part of right information in sri lanka because what we see here is not merely the release of the information but the actual rectification of the problem so in this case we saw the fact that it was not only that the government officials released their budgets and their and the information but they actually addressed the problem and uh, are addressing the problem even now so this trend you see across sri lanka so you see in the north for example where sri lanka has had a conflict for the last four decades or so the women are the foremost in challenging the state from issues of the disappearances of their children to uh, as you saw in the film uh, environmental protection the uh, you know waste issues garbage disposal issues the gamut of issues on which the challenge the government is quite quite amazing um so in 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 that regard really uh, there is a empowerment of the women that we see most particularly in sri lanka and that i find quite a extraordinary uh, uh, phenomena now one story out of the many many stories that i have heard i would just like to tell you or relate really um this particular woman in a in a extremely poor war torn area in sri in sri lanka in the north in kilinochi um objected to the building of a telecommunication tower on her land uh, because she said that it was a problem to the villagers it was a problem of environmental pollution so on and so forth and the tower was built on her land with the connivance of the local district uh, secretary officials who had not given permission uh, to the corporate which had built the tower or was trying to build the tower and also the male relatives in her family who had agreed for the tower to be built and she challenged all of them by filing rti in the district office and asking as to why and how the approvals were given and just and she succeeded in stopping the building of the tower on her land and one statement she made had was very powerful in that impact she said with one stroke of the rti i challenged the patriarchy in my family i challenged the corporate structure and i challenged the state and in a area where you don't challenge the state this has been a area that had conflicted rage for four decades where you don't challenge state officials on anything the fact that a woman a woman was able to do that and say this in such strong terms i think was very very symbolic of the way women have used rti in sri lanka mm -hmm. so thank you for that and i think what you're telling us and what we saw in the video also is that there is space for qualitative even anecdotal monitoring of rti uh, so on the one hand you have the dry data on how many requests which is not always uh, easy to uh, uh, make a gender based uh, assessment of the gender of the people making the requests and sometimes some would argue you shouldn't even try that but you have the the hard data on number of requests time of turnaround time and then you have the the qualitative data which you're talking about now which informs you as a commissioner about how your work is impacting so my question to you is do you do you see the role for both the qualitative and the quantitative data about your performance uh, and how do you use that combination to decide uh, anything you want to tweak in your in your practice promotions you want to do issues you want to take up kishalia i don't hear you uh kishalia i don't hear you uh, perhaps you want to just check your your mic i think you're yeah. can you hear me now yes and i can hear you 
Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, so the quantitative and quantitative data that has been collected so far tracking uh, SDGs in Sri Lanka has been actually of direct impact and useful and of use to the commission uh, because through that we've been able to see and uh, assess what exactly has worked uh, at the grassroots level with the communities that we're dealing with. So in a sense, from the commission's viewpoint, we do try to go beyond the mere release of information. We try to see where the release has actually helped to make a change in the development process in the country. Yeah. So for that, the, the, the collection of data that was started actually quite recently, of which one product is a film and another product is also a study that we've, we've done on, on SDG and RTI, uh, that has really uh, been used and is, is being used by the commission to uh, uh, reach out to the public agencies and assess the way in which policy changes could be made in the uh, uh, development process in Sri Lanka through the right to information law. Mm -hmm. um, in many instances, we have found that, uh, you know, major commonalities exist in the information deficit in the country. So if you look at issues of uh, environmental pollution, for example, or infrastructure, uh, you know, deficiencies or uh, even the provision of utilities like water and electricity um, to areas in Sri Lanka, commonalities exist in terms of what the problems are in the provision of the, of the utilities, so on and so forth. So in tracking the SDG uh, development uh, through the SDG development indicators, We've been able to try and uh, conceive or uh, have a framework in, in place which allows us to reach out to the public entities, to the state of officers and state entities and, and tell them, look, we've got hard data in our, hand, on, in our hands now, and this is where the improvements ought to take place. So that's at one level. At another level, it's also helped the commission itself because we've seen through the tracking of this data where the deficiencies arise in the RTI process itself. For example, though Sri Lanka's story of RTI has been, uh, you know, a relative success, as it were, for four years, there have been time lags in the provision of information, you know, to ordinary people and to information requesters. And it's only through the collation of that data that the commission itself also realized the extent to which this has impacted really on the realization of the RTI, on the full realization of the RTI regime in Sri Lanka. So at a dual level, it has helped the commission internally in terms of allowing the commission to see where its own gaps are, its own deficiencies are. And also it has helped the commission to really interact with state officers in reaching out to them and saying, look, there's a significant problem here, which the data shows and which you can't deny because it's hard data. What do we do about it? You know, how do we address this? Yeah. So it's been uh, quite a multiple impact. I think at many levels, there's been a very, very good impact. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I think that's extremely interesting. And uh, if I go back to the UNESCO findings that a number of um, respondents to our survey didn't have the data about how they are performing, um, which is an irony because they're supposed to make their information available, but they don't have information about how they're performing. I guess the minimum mm -hmm. is the quantitative data, but that's not the end of it because understanding impact through this kind of anecdote, uh, yeah. the, the, the looking on the ground is super important. Yeah. So Kishali, I, I hope I can come back to you later in the discussion with yeah. another question or two, but let's move on a bit. Um, and our next speaker is Gilbert Sendugwa who is Executive Director of the African Freedom of Information Center. Uh, Gilbert, uh, I must uh, reveal a, a secret here. Gilbert is uh, one of the uh, driving forces behind the fact that the United Nations last year agreed to recommend and accept today, uh, not today, yesterday, the 28th of September as the International Day. I think it's safe to say without Gilbert saying Dugwa, we may not have the day as a UN-wide day. So Gilbert, uh, I think everybody here says thank you for that. And uh, we celebrate your individual achievement and also the work of the Africa Freedom of Information Center. Now, my specific question to you, Gilbert is- Thank you again, everyone. Sure. <clears throat> a, a great achievement of AFIC has been in winning acceptance by the governments that open contracting data is really key for achieving the SDGs. 
Could you tell us a bit about which countries have accepted to make their contracting data transparent that you have been working with? And can you tell us what is the impact of this kind of transparency on procurement of government contracts? What's the impact on, on a country's de development path? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, greetings from Kampala. Yeah, uh, public contracting is very critical in the realization of sustainable development. As you know, uh, here in Africa, between 55 and 65 percent of national budgets every year is spent through public procurement. So this is the means to make sure that uh, citizens um, uh, access services they need for their development. We said uh, there are many problems uh, in public procurement. The World Bank estimates that 30% uh, of, of, of procurement value is lost through corruption and inefficiency. So in a way, without dealing with that, sustainable development will be delayed on the continent. So in 2015, ATIC and the CPDC, one of our members, we carried out a joint study where we analyzed commitments for open contracting by African governments who are members of the Open Government Partnership. We wanted to see if any government were making commitments on open contracting and at the, at the time, we didn't find any that uh, was making a commitment. So we started uh, advocacy. And in two years, we had six governments making commitments for open contracting. But also others, like Uganda, which are not uh, members of the OGP, also uh, came on board and in fact ran very fast than uh, uh, the other countries. So we have Ghana, we have uh, Marawi, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia as well. Uganda and Nigeria first track uh, those commitments to implementation at the four portals that align to open contracting data standards and went ahead to publish uh, thousands of contracts on these portals. We analyzed, first of all, we had a um, stakeholder engagement to discuss what we call use cases, asking different stakeholders what data they need for their work and for what reason. Uh, you seem to have for civil society, okay. efficiency uh, for procuring entities. Uh, and um, value for money for the oversight. So we developed indicators based on this, and then we went ahead in Uganda to analyze the data to see what the data was saying. Uh -huh. One of the issues we found that was of significance was that uh, there was high uh, diversion of funds, uh, which means that for every five contracts that we analyzed, for we are not reflected in procurement plans, which is a violation of the law. A number of these demote exist on the ground. A contract is signed, everything is done, but then you go on the ground, the project does not exist. Uh, we also, uh, on uh, efficiency, in the tendering process, we found that agencies were taking uh, 75 more days than they should take, uh, than is recommended by government, uh, uh, process, how long it should take. Mm -hmm. uh, we found on execution of uh, contracts afterwards, we found that uh, the average was as, uh, was as high as 300. Uh, Gilbert, you're breaking up. Maybe I could suggest you, you just close your video and maybe we can hear the, the audio. Okay, it seems we have a, a, a jam here. Um, perhaps I could ask uh, my 
my colleagues to just uh, message Gilbert in the chat and suggest that uh, he he closes his video camera and tells us when he's ready to come back. So, okay, well, let's move on in the meantime. Um, that was so interesting um, and particularly uh, hearing now about how this civil society initiative is also using data to monitor its own impact on access to information. So um, I think there's a lesson in there for, for governments as well to recognize the value of civil society as part of the effort of making uh, access to information available and assessing how it's going. So let's see if we can come back to Gilbert uh, later in the thing, in, in, in our webinar. So let's move on then uh, to uh, a good friend of UNESCO, uh, Blanca Ibarra Cadena, who is a commissioner from NI, that is the National in Institute for Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection in Mexico. So uh, Blanca, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I know you had a whole day yesterday of events in Mexico to really advance using this day on uh, access to information. So uh, just to tell people involved in this, um, this webinar, if you go to the interpretation button, you can uh, click to English because Blanca is going to speak in her mother tongue, which is Spanish. So, uh, Blanca, welcome, and I have um, I, I have a first request, a first question to you that I will put in English. Um, I posted earlier in the in the chat the link to Mexico oh, study, uh, and in it it says that in Mexico um, data is released re regularly about requests, particularly in relation to the pandemic. So you are releasing information about how many requests are coming that are linked to the pandemic. You are also releasing data on the type of information that gets requested, what's happening with the responses and the type of response given. So this is a strong achievement, especially in these tough conditions. Can you tell us a bit more about this uh, issue? How do you do it? What can others learn? And why is it important to release data, especially during this time of COVID? Over to you. Thank you, Danke. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone. And Guy, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share with you today Mexico's experience uh, in this area. Indeed, yes, in Mexico, we've had two very important uh, key moments. Uh, the first thing was uh, as of March, where we were uh, looking at how much time was taken to answer requests for information. And uh, this was uh, information uh, collated from the health authorities. Uh, and in particular, um, they have um, uh, they have been instrumental in ensuring that we get the data. And then uh, what they really wanted to make sure that there were, that everything could be done to respond to requests for information. Now, the um, National Institute for Transparency was looking at uh, how long it took to respond and the type of responses and what kind of resources were required. Um, some key data came out of uh, this. Uh, and I think it helps us to see how the Mexican uh, citizenship was actually able to um, understand uh, um, their own right to uh, request information. And it actually meant uh, that I think this actually showed us a lot about people's interest, uh, but also uh, it showed that people were taking a, a very big interest in what they could do to monitor their own health, keep their own uh, their own health safe, and ensure that they didn't transmit the virus during the pandemic. We've also been able to undertake um, um, a, a kind of uh, exercise in which, uh, and, and people were able to um, use their right to uh, access. Uh, uh, to access information to um, to ensure uh, that uh, they were doing their own part as good citizens uh, to prevent uh, the risks to one another. And there were um, uh, there were um, 
um, very good results when it came to the amounts or the actual numbers of requests and uh, the uh, the kinds of topics that were covered. On the one hand, we can see that people wanted to ask in uh, ask information about the uh, the transmission rates of the dyers, how many cases had been registered uh, in the uh, in the country, national cooperation, and and. Uh, uh, what kinds of measures had been uh, put in place to fight COVID, um, what the recovery rates were, what kinds of health measures had been put uh, in place, what kinds of statistics uh, surrounding um, uh, COVID and other uh, seasonal flu, um, data also concerning uh, pneumonia and in particular atypical um, uh, pneumatical, what uh, action plan or protocols were in place uh, uh, to, uh, to stem the tide of uh, transmission. And I, those were the key uh, topics that, that were covered. And I think it's also important to underscore that ENI has actually um, uh, set up a technical board uh, to deal with the uh, uh, with this particular issue, and what we've seen is is a permanently updated website uh, designed to ensure that the latest information is available uh, and will be um, made easily available to those who are responsible for responding to these requests for information. And uh, and what's more, uh, this has been tailored to the nature of the quest and the kind of information uh, requested each time. In other words, uh, we've been able to see exactly how useful uh, this was and uh, and uh, it, always with the focus of ensuring that the information available is timely as useful because we understand that information can save lives. And that is why uh, it's um, not only done through the health and uh, through statistics, but also through education. A lot has been done to make sure that all of this dovetails because this is what we call proactive uh, transparency. For example, um, there is one website which which uh, tries to uh, facilitate people's uh, uh, access to, to actually guide people to reliable sources of information. And also to look at, uh, we've also been looking at uh, the types of uh, uh, information um, consultations that are being undertaken. People are very worried. And, and there's a kind of saturation point that people, um, that people reach once they get bombarded with too much information. And yet it's not always the, the right kind of accurate information. That, and that's why we're looking at the different forms of, uh, of information campaigns with events, with uh, radio campaigns, um, to try to uh, focus on how important it is to have a, a tight uh, connection Connection between the, the information that's out there and people's ability to access it. And uh, from the very outset, it's been important to work at a grassroots level, indigenous communities, uh, to make sure that uh, they are able to uh, exercise this right of access to information. In other words, ensuring that the information reaches them in the right format at the right time. Moreover, um, the uh, technical secretariat uh, in the uh, in the network that uh, uh, that we were talking about before in uh, Latin America um, has uh, uh, means that Mexico really has its finger on the pulse, uh, and it means that we're able to share experience across uh, countries in Latin America. So it won't just remain in Mexico, but will be useful elsewhere. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. That was really fascinating. And uh, I, I think you, amongst the takeaways I, I get from you is one, you using this, this data about what you were doing, you could actually then be proactive and develop these websites. And second, that these websites are so important uh, uh, in the context of disinformation and misinformation, that the more you fill the space, the less there's a vacuum for, for gossip and, and rumor and uh, uh, ignorant or malicious information, or uh, I wouldn't even call it information, but uh, bad content to come into that space. 
So I'm going to come back to Gilbert in a minute, but I have one more question for you, uh, Blanca, which is that, uh, you know, in your region, you have a, a unique network of, uh, uh, of, of uh, access to information and data protection uh, bodies. You have, I think, 32 members. It's called the RTA. Now, this uh, RTA, uh, you've had many activities, a declaration, but you've also done research there into the performance of um, RTA bodies, RTI bodies in, in Latin America. You had a project where you measured resources, processes, and the results of transparency. Could you just take two minutes uh, and just give us, the, the, for example, the top two findings of, of that uh, project of measuring that, that, you, that, you, that you implemented? Yes, many thanks, Guy. In fact, in different Latin American countries in our region, and with the democratic wave we had in the last decades, we've also had a big pickup in the right to information via laws and other public measures for transparency. And we've tried to make sure that RTA played a relevant role. They have committed themselves to 38 institutions in 17 countries. And what we've also wanted to have is this ongoing formal space for dialogue, for cooperation, and is for exchange of knowledge. And that this has remained extremely relevant, particularly in this time of pandemic. We're saying in our region of the world, months or weeks afterward, the, after the first cases of COVID, we've been able to prepare in such a way that the organizations whose goal or mission is to guarantee rights has also been able to be in close communication with the authorities and then at the same time not expose people to this risk, given all the needs for transparency that we have. And in from 2011 onward, from the time this network existed, 13 countries in the region had a specific regulatory framework. And now there are 18 that have this type of standard setting. There are also 15 countries in the region which have organizations which guarantee a right of access to information. And many of the organizations, like our Mexican one, are institutionally autonomous. We're anonymous from state power. We have an autonomy that is given from the Constitution, which is our Magna Carta. There are regional bodies which have consolidated various different initiatives, including a metric for transparency, which is one of the most important projects to identify and to allow us to show in different regions of Latin America how progress is being made in the subject, how things are proceeding in general when we're talking about the right to information with a model of documentary management that allows us to have a toolbox for legislative transparency because we need to talk not just about executive branch transparency, it's also important to talk about open justice and parliamentary transparency, which are also necessary. We've had a focus on gender transparency in politics as well, particularly with groups that have been traditionally excluded from development processes. And all of this is related to the subject of the measurement medal that we have rolled out with uh, the Eurosocial Group. It is a tool which is rounded off by each country's own contributions in the years 2008 and 2009, which has allowed us to identify strengths, weaknesses, challenges, and transparency policy. Generally speaking, and to conclude, Guy, we have been able to absorb, sorry, observe a high level of determination in formal aspects. And we've also seen a 7.2 ranking on a scale of 10. And we already mentioned this before, we need to look at the level of implementation of laws. It's not enough simply to create laws, although that's important. We also have to see how these are implemented, the social impact that those laws have. And to this end, I think we have lower level of results, only 5.3 on the same scale 
which shows that effective implementation is lagging behind in the legislative framework of our countries. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think that again, that's that's really fascinating. And uh, it's it just points to the value, I think, of taking uh, an approach to monitoring access to information beyond individual countries, because there's so much good practice and good experience to to share, but that depends on having some comparative uh, data across different countries. So uh, let's come back to Gilbert. And Gilbert, maybe you just want to put um, your, your mic on, but not your video camera, just so we don't lose you again. Um, For sure. It's all about the disconnection. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. The, these are the realities. So I also wanted to just say that uh, this UNESCO survey that we did, we had 24 countries uh, responding from Latin America and the Caribbean. And thank you uh, to this RTA network uh, and Blanca for helping us get those responses. And then in Africa, we had 20 countries responding and thanks to AFIC for helping us in getting those responses. So my question to you, Gilbert, is how can we support African information commissioners or equivalents to be uh, better capacitated to monitor access to information and encourage their governments to uh, resource them and to take this seriously in the SDG process and the SDG reporting. Yeah, thank you very much. Data uh, um, uh, management, including uh, correction, uh, keeping and retrieval is very critical in empowering information oversight bodies to perform their work, whether it is uh, uh, capacity building, uh, providing feedback to ministries, departments, and agencies, or reporting to either uh, legislators or uh, uh, UNESCO, the quality of uh, record keeping and retrieval is very, very critical. Now, these states, especially in the African uh, context, uh, information commissions and uh, uh, MDAs are very challenged as far as uh, record keeping is, is concerned. Now, one of the issues that needs to be addressed is the issue of uh, uh, standardization of record management for purposes of access to information. Now, this is very critical because uh, the access to information laws provide statutory timeline within which information should be disclosed. Also, within which various actions should be made, for example, annual reporting by commission to parliament. So if record management is not uh, in good shape, it is going to meet uh, um, a challenge uh, meeting obligations uh, uh, by these entities. So one of the issues that could be done is to engage bodies like the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and maybe uh, UNESCO to come up with guidelines for record keeping and, uh, and uh, in the context of access to information. Side by side with this is the capacity building to make sure that uh, you know, these commissions have uh, space, they have the right uh, equipment, people and skills for records management. Mm -hmm. And this should be, they should be able to transfer this also to ministries, departments and agencies that are covered by uh, access information legislation. Now, looking at across the information commissions uh, in Africa, this area has not yet been uh, uh, profiled as part of a critical um, part of uh, implementation and overseeing access to information. I think uh, networks like ours could play a role there in advocating, for number one, for uh, uh, guidelines, but also profiling the need for capacity in record keeping and management so that the commissions can play uh, this important role. Mm -hmm. Also, MDS, uh, you find that uh, the capacities are very low. 
and maybe in an environment of scarce uh, resources, negotiating this uh, is not easy. So civil society organizations and networks working with information commission could uh, profile this issue so that uh, the key decision makers in allocating resources see the need because uh, agencies are not going to be able to comply if the quality of record management uh, is very, very weak. Mm -hmm. uh, we maintain uh, the other area that we could work with uh, or support is knowledge management. Uh, each, each year uh, for the uh, three years, 2015, 14, 14, 15, and 17, we undertook study on uh, the status of access information implementation in Africa. The last covered 23 countries. Maybe a study like this focusing on uh, records management could provide a basis for discussions and engagement so that uh, solutions could be found. We have uh, members, uh, a network of 41 members in uh, 22 African countries. So we have uh, a network and reach that could help to uh, address this issue. So those are mm -hmm. some of the ways through which uh, we could be of assistance uh, to information commissions and stakeholders in this place. Okay, well, thank you. I think that was uh, inspiring and creative and uh, we need to follow up. So thank you, Gary. I see we have some Q&A and I would just like to ask um, our, our key uh, panelists, Kishali, Gilbert, Blanca, and we're going to come to Julia. Now, if you can also look at the Q&A and see if you could give it. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so if I can ask the, 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 the speaker so far to look at the Q&A and see if you can answer electronically and maybe we've got a few minutes to uh, have some some comments on them as well. But I'd like to ask, uh, we have two, two, we still have two more speakers. And so uh, let me turn and give the floor to Julia Kircher, who is senior expert at the UND mm -hmm. Oslo Governance Center and the Global Alliance for Reporting Progress on SDG 16, which is peaceful, just and inclusive societies under which this access to information comes. So thank you, Julia, for joining us and for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, I'm sure in two sentences or three sentences, you can tell us what is the Global Alliance. But in particular, I'd like you to then go on to tell us about a pilot initiative you have in seven countries where you are seeking to persuade and convince uh, governments to integrate SDG 16 into their national development planning. So Julia, please, uh, can you respond? Thanks so much, Guy. Um, and uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for um, partnering with the Global Alliance for this event. It's a pleasure to, to be part of it. Um, the, as you said, the, the Global Alliance in a nutshell uh, is an alliance of uh, member states, civil society organizations, UN agencies, including UNDP, for which I work, um, and the private sector, which is quite rare to have an alliance that includes also private sector actors. Um, and the focus of the Global Alliance is not only SDG 16, um, but uh, monitoring and reporting progress on, or, or the lack thereof, of course, um, on SDG 16. So among the networks that work on SDG 16, this, uh, the Global Alliance focuses on monitoring and reporting, um, which is why it's very relevant here. Um, the, the initiative that you mentioned, um, we call it the SDG 16 National Monitoring Initiative actually includes now uh, more than 10 countries. It started off as a, as a UNDP initiative, but has become a Global Alliance initiative because it's so aligned with uh, the objectives of the Global Alliance. And it really draws on, on, the, on all the members and uh, the UN agencies and, and other members of the, of the Global Alliance. Um, now, let's, uh, let me take a step back and uh, 
speak a little bit about uh, what the hurdles uh, are, what we found the hurdles are in measuring SDG 16 um, at the country level and uh, using those results in, in national planning processes. Um, and here I'm, I'm drawing on the National Monitoring Initiative, but also on other reports, uh, for example, the Global Alliance report um, that came out for the High Level Political Forum last year. Um, and an interesting report um, of a South African think tank that looks at measuring SDG 16 in Africa. Um, and I'll share those resources. Um, I'll, I'll, of course, I'll, I'll summarize here just to mention a few. What's most often mentioned as a hurdle is, of course, and we've heard this today already, is uh, political support, political will and uh, sensitivities around SDG 16. Um, and that's true because the SDG 16 particularly includes issues that are very, um, that are opaque often, that happen, that are sometimes criminal, that are not, not, not happening in, out in the open, right? Um, like corruption or so, or uh, violence. Um, now, one can get hung up on this and say, oh, this is such a problem for monitoring SDG 16, but there are other issues that are also hurdles that can actually help overcome this we find. So one aspect that we find um, is that um, there's, a, there's a real uh, need for SDG 16, but also for other goals, but perhaps more so for SDG 16, to become nationally relevant, because these big topics like corruption, violence, and so on, um, are uh, scary. So it's, it's very important for national actors to make them um, tangible and resonate at the country level for the policy context and for people in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's why in, in a lot of the, the pilot countries that uh, we're working with, um, uh, the, the first step was often to um, nationalize the, the, the indicators to adapt them and see what is already being measured, what are the topics in the country that are relevant um, under SDG 16. And I'll just give you an example from Uruguay, um, which uh, clustered the, the SDG 16 indicators into four topics, violence and security, access to justice and rights, transparency, governance, and access to information, so specifically there, and then participation and inclusion. So they clustered these topics in their own way so that it, it resonated with issues that are relevant in the country. Um, so that's national relevance. The other one is um, funding. A lot of the, um, in fact, 13 of the uh, 23 um, SDG 16 indicators require surveys um, to, to get the data. And surveys are always expensive for countries. So that's also a sort of a stumbling block in many cases. And um, one of the things that um, uh, some of the partners in the Global Alliance, um, UNDP, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and UNODC are doing now is to develop a survey module that countries um, can integrate in their household surveys. So this survey module covers all the survey-based indicators in SDG 16 so that then countries can just take that module and plug it into their, um, or adapt it if they want, of course, and plug it into their household survey. So they don't have to spend money themselves to develop um, these, these survey questions, which is a, a huge process. Um, so funding is, is another issue. So those are some of the hurdles. What have we learned from that? And what are we doing in that national monitoring initiative? The National Monitoring Initiative has three elements, I would call them, not necessarily steps because they don't have to happen sequentially. Um, and those three are identification of indicators and data that exists in the country, indicators that are relevant, as we said, data that exists or that is required. Um, then a key second step, if it hasn't happened right from the beginning, is stakeholder engagement. So involving um, different parts of society, um, different types of actors to see um, are these uh, indicators and is this data the most relevant? Is this all we have? Are there other data sources? Are there other indicators that are relevant? So stakeholder engagement. And the third element is um, institutionalizing this process. So setting up, for example, report card um, exercises so that um, the monitoring of SDG 16 
happens not only once when there is a voluntary national report coming up, for example, but regularly. So what, uh, in a nutshell and in summary, um, this methodology draws or builds on these hurdles, these challenges around SDG 16 and helps bring key data actors together to um, also ensure follow-up and accountability on how that data is used. Mm. And actually some, several of the countries in the National Monitoring Initiative have already used the results of the initiative um, pretty quickly actually to draft SDG 16 chapters for their voluntary national reports. That was not the intention, actually. It was just meant to support yeah. them at the national level, but they 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 leveraged that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, it it does. I think I think you made the point that if states have this data, for example, if there's data already on access to information and how it's going, then it's easy to populate a survey survey because you've got the data. You've got it for yourself. A survey is just a yeah, you know, nice to have to show internationally how you're performing, but for your own domestic purposes and your own institutional purposes, to have that data on a regular basis is is really the name of the game, and that's what we have to to try and work towards. Now, you mentioned obstacles, and uh, I'll share with you and the people on this webinar that UNESCO uh, had an experience of an obstacle when we, we were trying to collect data uh, for the survey that we sent the survey with our partners at the UNESCO Institute of Statistics to the official SDG bodies, which are often statistics commissions. And in some cases they said, well, we don't have this data. We're not collecting it at the national statistics level. And meantime, we knew that actually there was an information commission that has the data, but they're not linking up. So here's my question to you. Can the Global Alliance play a role in trying to, um, I suppose, broaden the remit of these national SDG bodies uh, so that they don't only look at what data they immediately have, but who may have the data, including civil society may have some data as well. What can the Global Alliance do there? Yeah, um, uh, and that's actually one of the uh, the reasons almost, I would say, that the Global Alliance exists to bring these, these different data actors um, uh, together. Um, one aspect is, of course, national versus international data. Is the, the country producing the data or is um, an international body producing the data, right? And there, I agree, it's already very important that um, information and data is generated at the, at the country level to make sure it's owned and not just sort of uh, uh, showcasing a country, right, independently. It has its, its, its remits, but it's, it's important that data gets produced in the country. Now, who produces the data in the country? We often, and I, I want to mention these terms because um, they're often, I think they're often difficult to understand. We often talk about official versus non-official data. And often that's understood as being government data versus non-governmental data. But that's actually not really the case. Official data is, um, and the statisticians amongst us will know this much better than me, official data is really the data that the, the statistical system in the country has accepted as official data. So very often that is the data that national statistical offices collect. And there you may be right, they might not collect everything that's needed. Um, but uh, official data can also be data that is produced, let's say, by a university or by an NGO, if um, it's been produced in collaboration with, let's say, the statistical um, office, um, so that um, there certain standards are adhered to, um, that that data is solid and reliable, um, so there's certain quality assurance, right? And if that happens, if that collaboration happens, then, um, uh, non-state actor data, let's say civil society data, can become official data for the country. An NGO then has to decide, of course, if they want that, or if they want to sort of sit uh, outside the statistical system and say, we, uh, we don't agree or we have alternative data. But that data, non-state data, can become official data. I think it's an important point because it means that that collaboration is so important. And the Global Alliance has just, um, uh, we, we're helping in with the National Monitoring Initiative, we're helping countries do that through that stakeholder engagement step. 
Um, but there's also uh, guidance forthcoming and existing already, and I'll share that as well. Um, the, the Global Alliance just released a, a guide to report on SDG 16 in VNRs, and it has a whole section on how to collaborate with different stakeholders on data. And um, they're very useful examples in there, for example, um, how the Kenyan National Human Rights um, Institution, which is often very similar or has a similar setup to um, um, access to information commissions, um, worked very closely with the National Statistical Office to identify vulnerable groups in the country, right, and, and share data on that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a very useful example to learn from. We also have an, an example from Sri Lanka in there. Um, so, you know, people are free to, to browse it and to see what they um, think about it. That's a that guy that- I need to, sorry, jump in now to ask you to wrap up because we need to come to our last speaker. Yes, and actually the, the uh, this is just a, like a little bit of a commercial that because we have one um, um, resource forthcoming. It's a guide to help uh, countries use the voluntary national reports to um, feed the results into the policy process. So mm -hmm. they, let's say the post VNR step, not just focusing on the VNR, but afterwards. So those are two uh, key resources that I'll share. Thank you. Please do post them into the chat. And uh, your point about this cooperation, I think is of course SDG 17 about partnerships and partners don't have to agree on everything, but they can find common ground under this agenda and they can retain their right to have their own independent uh, uh, voices as well. So let's hope that we can get uh, these partnerships for access to information. Now I have great pleasure in asking uh, Ambassador Hans uh, Wesseling, permanent representative of Netherlands to UNESCO to help us make some closing remarks. Um, I hope uh, others, the, some of the panelists have been able to respond to the, the Q and A because we don't have time for live Q and A, but please, uh, the, is that possibility. Uh, the Netherlands, as I mentioned, along with uh, Germany and Sweden have been super supporters of UNESCO in trying to roll out this work. Uh, so Ambassador Wesseling, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Guy, for um, asking me to participate in this, uh, in this, for me, extremely educative and interesting, interesting meeting. Certainly because I will be one of the ones that will be participating in the IPDC Council in November. So I have to say a great deal of my homework has already been done by all the very valuable um, uh, speakers during this program, making my life uh, slightly easier than it, um, uh, than it could have been uh, before IPDC. Um, your, your main question was how can uh, ATI, um, Access to Information, effectively contribute to achieve SDGs? Um, let me just say as more general uh, remark is that we're living in a tough time for um, for ethics and for norms. That means we're living in a very tough time uh, for UNESCO. And the flip side of that is that UNESCO can now really prove that it is the conscience of the UN. I mean, it's a tough time, yes, but uh, uh, UNESCO can, uh, can help show us the way. Sometimes I even think that with ethics and norms, we are getting close to bankruptcy. Now, there's one uh, very famous man who said something about that, Ernest Hemingway. He once asked a millionaire, how, how is it that you became bankrupt? Well, he said, there are two phases. First, it was gradual, then it was sudden. Now, the tipping point is between those two. We are very far on the gradual. We're not yet in the sudden. And I think uh, with a certain sense of urgency, uh, UNESCO should pick up on its original task and um, guide us away back to ethics and, uh, and norms again. That's my, my, my more uh, uh, general statement. Now, um, I, I have great appreciation uh, for all those who, um, uh, uh, who have uh, spoken. And I would like to start with, um, uh, with uh, Friedrike uh, Kercher, who, uh, who kicked off. And um, uh, she mentioned that uh, the bad news was the, the, that the, the most essential point is you've got legislation but um, it really comes to implementation. You can talk the talk, but you should also walk the walk. The bad news is that um, and not walking the walk is caused by lack of resources, lack of political will, and lack of data. The good news is um, uh, those problems can be tackled. And I totally agree with, uh, with Frederike. And one of the ways to tackle it is by dry data number crunching, because then uh, that is the missing link in laws that have been passed 
but how to um, how to implement them. Um, I have also uh, listened carefully um, to uh, to Kishali, um, who um, actually concluded, and that I, I fully support, is the impact it has on women empowerment. And uh, that's something I didn't think of myself. And I'm really struck by the words she mentioned by one of the women that has spoken, that's spoken out, I think, against these uh, G5 masks or uh, uh, the, the telecom masks in her garden. And she said, I challenge patriarchy, I challenge corporate, um, uh, 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 big corporations, and I challenge the state. Well, good luck for her. And I'm really glad she did well and that, um, that things have changed. Uh, Blanca, um, you have uh, spoken very uh, clearly about something that's very important, and that is uh, um, information sharing via websites and being proactive and transparent. Very important because normally we have this problem of, okay, you want information, you ask your government, and you have to wait 30 days. If Mexico has now decided, let's be proactive, I think that's a huge step uh, forward and a very good example for um, uh, for very many other uh, uh, governments. Um, then our, um, uh, then my uh, dear colleague, um, uh, uh, Gilbert Sendukwa, who has, um, uh, uh, who has touched upon uh, the aspect of uh, public procurement and corruption in which ATI plays a very effective and, uh, and efficient role. Um, Last but not least, uh, the role of the Global uh, Alliance in bringing uh, data actors uh, together. Um, may, may, I, may I conclude? Because I've also been watching uh, very carefully um, the film that was shown uh, in the beginning. And the film put it very, or the video uh, made, I think, in Sri Lanka, put it very, um, very fundamentally and carefully. We are here also to debunk falsehoods and mitigate risks. Um, we are here also, and that is the very positive uh, side is we are here to generate trust, save lives, and bring hope. I think that is one of the things that ATI does without you really realizing it. But then you really have to talk to experts like uh, uh, like you all are. Conclusion, um, Guy, uh, did we answer your question? How effectively? How can um, we effectively contribute to achieving SDGs? Well, more than sixteen. We can we can achieve um, progress on gender equality. We can achieve progress on health, on environment, on debunking falsehoods, on combating corruption, achieving transparency um, and, uh, and uh, encouraging participation and working against violence. Well, that's quite a lot of SDGs that we have been uh, helping here. May I steal one more minute of your time, um, dear friends and certainly uh, dear Guy, by um, uh, informing you that the Netherlands will be holding uh, the World Press um, Freedom Conference on 9 and 10 December. We will host a digital World Press Freedom Conference that jointly celebrates World Press Freedom Day and International Day to end impunity for crimes against journalists. All attendees of today are warmly welcome. Once more, Guy, once more, dear panelists, once more, dear colleagues, thank you very, very much for this highly informative session about access to information. Thank you so much, Ambassador. All I can say is onward and upward. Thank you, everybody. Happy International Day for access, universal access to information. We have some more webinars even coming up tomorrow and the next day. So keep watching. Uh, I'm sure this uh, has been a, an excellent taster for what else you can take part in. So I think we can just close with the last slide and if people want to watch the introductory video again that yeah. Ambassador Veslin mentioned. Thank you everybody and thank you. Thank you very much. Bye guys. Thanks. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Vesem, do you want to just uh, close out with the video? Okay, I see it's coming. Thank you, Matt. Slow. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not uh, it's not essential. We did see it at the beginning. So, super. Everybody have a wonderful rest of the day, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And let's keep pushing access to information, monitoring it, getting to grips with 
how the world is progressing, especially in COVID times, about access to information, which saves lives and can bring hope. Thank you. Goodbye. The recording has stopped.